Um, you can find out everything that's going wrong in the world today is in the word of God. We're warned about it. And in Ecclesiastes um, chapter 11, we're going to. Um, one of the things we talked about is good works. God expects us to do things. What he doesn't expect is we all quit. Um, and every single person has to do what God says. Um, and so I just want to go quickly through it um, because there's nothing more encouraging than knowing what God wants. Um, it says in Ecclesiastes 11 verse 1, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. Now, one of the things is, what does it mean casting your uh, bread upon the waters? It, the word, the bread of God is the word of God. And when you speak the word of God, you cast it upon the waters. Now, sometimes it appears that nothing's happened. Um, I've found one of the amazing things when you're in a church and you've got um, 800,000 people coming every week and people are coming from all over. I'll tell you one of the things that happens. You see people walk in and they come and they hear and they go and they come and they hear and they go. And then you don't see them for a month or two and they come back. Um, and then they come for a couple of weeks and then they go. And then they come again and they go. But amazingly enough, they can't get away from the word that's gone in. And if you cast your bread upon the waters, um, it'll, you'll find it after many days. And that's the amazing thing. God works in a mysterious way. And he goes on to explain it like this um, in verse 4. He, he that, um, uh, let me see, he that um, observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. Now, if you look out, and you, it's never the right time to sow, and it's never the right time to reap. That's why I've always admired farmers. Um, if it's hot, there's a drought. If it's raining, it's too wet. Uh, there's always a reason why they've got a complaint. Um, and it, what has happened is man tries to manipulate things. So now they've tried to get GM crops and they're trying to get things to work in a way that God never designed. And once you do that, you're in trouble. Um, and he goes on and he puts it like this. Um, verse 5, As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand. For thou knowest not whether shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. Um, there, there's no way, if you think about it, no man can figure out how a baby grows in the womb. How, how do bones get in a child in a womb? How do they grow? No one knows. Only God knows that. And in the same way, when a seed's planted, you don't know what's happening to it. God alone knows. And God alone decides. You don't know which is going to be good and which is going to be bad. If you sow in the morning or you sow in the evening. Sometimes when you speak, you get an awful shock. I remember years ago, my sister-in-law came to the church for the first time. And being my sister-in-law, she was a women's liver. And she was of the Burn the Bra Brigade. And she felt that if she did her hair... Um, it was kind of an affront, and she looked like a, um, a tramp, really, because she wore clothes 
that were just um, layer upon layer. And she didn't want to pander to men's views. And frankly, the way she looked, she didn't. Um, she, she succeeded. She looked awful. And so she, when my wife and I uh, were getting ready for church, we were shocked when she said she'd come. And she came and she sat on the front row next to my wife. And um, I thought, what's going to happen here? Because she was totally anti-Christian, bitter as hell. And um, in the middle of the uh, sermon, for some reason that only the Spirit of God could explain, I, I, you know, that's my excuse. I said to me, um, I said to the, to the people, I said, um, well, I said, um, the Bible says thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife or thy neighbor's ass. And sometimes you can't tell which is which. <laughs> at which point she picked up a Bible and threw it at my wife. Thank God it wasn't at me. She was so angry. Uh, you know, it really got to her uh, that you could call a woman an ass. <laughs> but she proved the point. Um, she threw it. Sure. And I carried on preaching, trying to ignore her irate um, demonstration and to my shock when when at the end of the meeting I asked people to respond and I began to pray and I heard someone crying and to my <laughs> utter surprise it was her and she fell on her knees repented God met her and in a moment transformed her. Um, now, it just shows you don't know what is going to be fruitful and what isn't. You don't know what God's going to do. Uh, why I said that about, um, you, know, uh, you know, a woman, you know, uh, a wife, and you couldn't tell <laughs> a wife from an ass. I don't know. I've never said it again um, except... To to use it as an illustration. But the fact is that something like that can impact a person and transform them. And what has happened in the church is everyone tries to make the gospel acceptable. Um, pe people don't understand that you don't know how God's going to operate, what God's going to do. God is God. And I found the fascinating thing in life is when God wants to do something, he'll do it. And you, you, you always find people who want perfect conditions. Uh, when they go out to preach, they want perfect conditions. When they go into a church, they want perfect conditions. I've always found that when things go wrong, God goes right. And, and, and often that God will do something in the most adverse conditions. Um, my sister-in-law got converted. She sold up everything. She moved to the church, and to the day of her death, she was in the church. Now, why? Because God got hold of her. That was her time. And God has a time for everyone. Um, there's a time where suddenly God will come. I've had people stay in the church 13, 14 years, and everything that's preached goes over their head. And I've learned what that means, you know, uh, people who listen and then they imagine that it applies to everyone else and never to them. Or they go, like a goat, duck their head and the word goes over the top of it. I don't know what happened. But then suddenly one day, without any reasoning, you're preaching and the person, it gets hold of him. And it goes like an arrow to the heart, and bang, they come in. Now, the Bible makes it plain in Ecclesiastes. You don't know the time that God's going to use a particular word to do what you want it to do. So don't ever look at the wind. People say, oh, you know, I feel the Spirit of God is moving now. Well, that's just emotionalism. You've got to, in season and out of season, whatever you feel, you have to be faithful to what God says. It's true. 
and you'll find that the fruit will appear uh, in a, a, a time that you don't expect it. Um, in the morning, sow thy seed. In the evening, withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether shall prosper, either this or that. And it's amazing how many people think if you get the right conditions, if you get the right atmosphere, then someone will respond. Now, you know, years ago I had um, uh, a um, evangelist, well-known evangelist, come to the church, and his two daughters came, and, and they were dressed such as um, they shouldn't have been dressed, you know. Um, they dressed like they were going to a nightclub. And I told them, if you want to come to my church, don't dress like that, you dress decent. Um, and um, I was very straight with them. I said, you know, if you come to a church, you young ladies, and, uh, you know, people know the color of your knickers when you sit down. It's not edifying for anyone. Uh, you're coming here to meet God. You know, and I was quite plain with them, you know, as, um, as discreet as I could be. In the same way, you don't come dressed like a tramp. You come to meet the King of Kings. That's the way it is. And, and you have to be careful. Now, I pointed that out, and um, the evangelist got hold of me. Oh, he said, you don't know. My daughters go off to nightclubs so they can witness for Jesus. I said, look, if you go to where drunks are, you're not going to witness anything but deception. Because your manner of life has got to be a Christian life. You can't run with the world or run with the hounds, you know, and hunt with the foxes. You just can't do it. It's just incompatible. Life is incompatible. Um, now, you can sow the seed, but it doesn't mean you go anywhere. Um, you live the life that Christ intends. There are principles in God. And if you violate those principles, you're in trouble. That's the way it is. There is no way you can live on both sides of the fence. You can't. Uh, you'll deceive yourself if you think you can. Don't work. And um, so it's not suggesting that you go anywhere to preach the word. I've found people suggest, oh, well, uh, you know, we're Christians, therefore it doesn't matter where we go. It sure does. It really does. Um, and that's what the Bible teaches. Um, and if you don't believe me, I'm just coming to the bit that will show you. Um, Ecclesiastes is very clear about it. Um, there is a way to live and there's a way not to live. If you don't live the right way, it's wrong. And I used to tell people, and I still tell people, hey, look, God sees everything. And so he puts it in the Bible. So it's so plain, you can't miss it. Um, goes on here. Truly, the light is sweet, and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man live many years and rejoice in them all, Yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. All that cometh is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thine heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Now, if you think you can just live anyway, and it's okay, God says, okay, in the days of your youth, you live anyway, but you're going to be brought into judgment. There's no way God's going to ignore it. And one of the things that happens, it's in verse 9, one of the things that happens is people get caught. They think that somehow God doesn't see, but God sees everything. Therefore... Remove sorrow from thine heart and put away evil from thy flesh. For childhood and youth are vanity. And then he goes on, and there's no chapter division in the Hebrew. 
Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, uh, what shall you say? Um, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble and the strong men shall bow themselves and the grinders cease because they are few. And those that look out of the window be darkened and the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Also, when they shall be afraid of that which is high and fears shall be in the way and the almond tree shall blossom and the grasshopper shall be a burden and desire shall fail because man goeth to his long home and the mourners go about the streets or ever the silver cord be loosed or the golden bowl be broken or the pitcher be broken at the fountain or the wheel broken at the system then shall the dust return to the earth as it was and the spirit shall return to God who gave it. And it's talking about life. Um, there's coming a time, and it now is, um, where in truth, we're all going to face the fact that evil's waxing worse and worse. Justice has gone out of the window. There is no justice anymore. Righteousness has vanished. And what we have in society is people saying wrong is right. They're saying good is evil and evil is good. Uh, there's a whole system come up and, and it's coming into the church where people are compromising what's true. Look, it is wrong to live wrong. There's no such thing as same-sex marriage. The Bible forbids it. There is no such thing as love outside of a true partnership between a man and a woman. God forbids it. There is no way that children should be brought up in a home where there's not a husband who's a father and a wife who's the mother. It's wrong. God forbids it. And you can't change it because you're a humanist and say, well, yeah, but. There is no yeah, but. God's word is God's word. And we need to face that. And what's happened in society is people want to compromise it and say, oh, no. Well, you've got to understand we're in a modern era. No, we're not in a modern era. We're in a devilish era. Things have gone wrong. And we have to face the fact that truth is truth. And now at four-year-olds are being taught in schools that, you know, there's equality. And the equality means that two girl, women can get together, two men, um, you know, of the same sex, they can have families. Now they're going to pay for it on the National Health Service, um, you know, up to the age of 42. It's a disgrace. Totally and utterly. And there's no way Christians can be part of it. We stand up and we say it is wrong. Now we don't turn around and just keep our mouths shut because if the good men say nothing, evil prevails. Uh, one of the things that happened in uh, Nazi Germany was Hitler got up and he only had a small group of people around him. And first of all, they thought he was a crank. Then they thought he was crazy. Then they thought that he, his attitudes and, and uh, speaking would never take root. But I want to tell you what happened. He promised people that this was the way to wealth, this was a way to success, this was a way to everything. And soon people, their eyes got turned away from morality into the wrong things and they went and the church is going the same thing they promised people wealth they promised people you know prosperity they promised people things and they're compromising on the issues of morality you can't take 
morality out. And that evil man, I can't remember his name, who keeps speaking, an atheist, keeps speaking out, turns around and says, oh, the Bible hasn't got any moral tone to it. I mean, what a jackass he is. I mean, that's the only word I can think of. Um, you know, there are laws in God, and those laws you cannot violate. Is that plain? Hello? Uh, and once you, you compromise on those things and those issues, you have no touchstone for truth. You have no touchstone for life. And what's happening is people are in fear now. Um, in America, would you believe it, there's farmers who wanted to grow the crops organically and the police came in with machine guns and they raided the farm because they weren't using the chemicals that Monsanto Chemicals wanted them to use. And they shut the farm down. They demanded the animals be put down. Well, how can you do that? Um, they want us to conform to their tyranny. Um, Bill Gates, one of his agendas is he wants to decrease the world population by 10%. Now, God's in charge of, of what happens, not Bill Gates. He might have a lot of money. He might have been successful, but he's a jackass. If he thinks he can stand up and make a proposal and ship out drugs to Africa with the intention of making people sterile so that they depopulate the world. And he said, you can have a better life if you remove 10% of the population. Then you've got drug companies that are giving people drugs, knowing full well they cause disease and kill you. And they're doing it on purpose. Even in this country, they're, you know, they're trying to give statins to people over 50, um, even if they're healthy. And they know it causes brain hemorrhages, it causes blindness, it causes deafness, it causes heart attacks, it causes uh, seizures. And they want to give them to everyone over 50. Those are the side effects. And they found in a study in America that more people survive who don't take the drugs than who do. And, and yet they're foisting it on us. Now, why are they doing it? Because evil's getting worse and worse. Is what the Bible teaches. Hey, the keepers of the house shall tremble, strong men shall bow themselves. What's happening? A collapse in the economy. A collapse of the things. It's the people who go out um, and the, the population gets less. I tell you what happens, everything decays. I can take you to places in Africa and you can go in Nigeria and all of a sudden you'll see houses empty. They're just dropping apart. Now instead of maintaining them, they just let them go. Why? Because there's no population there, they're moved on. And we've got to face the fact that God intends us to be the builder of the old waste places, not to depart and not to decrease. We're told to increase. The Bible says God's purpose was we increase and multiply, we replenish the earth. He did not say that we uh, impoverish the earth and impoverish people. Um, it says also, verse 5, when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fear shall be in the way. Uh, people are afraid of governments now. They're afraid of authority. Why? Because authority is imposing on them restrictions that are insane. Why is it that I can't, for instance, go out and buy normal milk? Why do I have to go out and buy milk that's going to poison me? because they have got a system of long life in the milk. Why shouldn't I be able to go out? Why shouldn't the farmers be allowed to sell me decent milk that comes out of the cow? Why has it got to be processed? Why has it got to be dealt with? Why is it you can get arrested? In America, they've actually broken into people's houses, emptied the fridge of fresh milk, because they want to impose on them their standard where they can tax them. I mean, what's going wrong with the world? Why is it that certain things that are natural things are no longer available? 
why are they purposely denuding society of cancer-fighting natural products so that you'll have to use drugs? Why is it that they have, have a militant attitude against... And then you discover it's money. And love of money is the root of all evil. And the root of all evil has gone into our food chain. It's gone into our uh, drug companies. It's gone into everything. And they're trying to manipulate the population. I think it's terrible that people over 65 now are just numbers. And the sooner they die, the better. Why aren't they treating everyone the same? Why is age a difference? One of the things, you go to a hospital, first thing they want you to know is your date of birth, how old you are. And on that, they make decisions, medical, clinical decisions. But they're not making the decisions because that's what they want to do. They're making the decisions because that's what they're told to do. And, you know, they look on their computer and Pace tells you, oh, you, you know, if they're that age, it's not available. So what they're doing is they're manipulating society and no one stands up against it. It's just a thing of, oh, well, you know, that's the way it is. Well, no. Christians have to stand up in the gap and say, just a minute, I'm not prepared to live like that. God says something different. And because God says it, I'm going to fight for it. I'm not going to be a neutral pacifist who says, oh, well, hey, sirrah, sirrah, whatever will be, will be. No, it won't. Because if Christians stand up, I'll tell you what will happen. You can reverse everything. God is expecting a people to stand up for what is righteousness, what is moral, and what is holy, and what has happened is that we're drifting into the state where people are afraid to make a stand about anything. Well, you know, well, you, that's just the way it is. Well, you can't do anything. Well, you know, well, I want to tell you, evil people are waxing worse and worse, and they believe they can get their own way. Stonewall, the homosexual lobby, thinks they can get their own way. They've foisted it on society. And they're 1% of the population. Well, 72% of the population said they're Christian. Why don't they stand up and say no to the 1%? Instead of allowing society to drift down because they don't love their kids or care for their future. People have to ask themselves questions. You know, and if you start to stand up, then you're going to get opposition. Because no one wants righteousness. What they want is they want their way. Politicians in Parliament, they don't do what the people want. They do what they want. And they're only interested in power and money. They're not interested at all in morality. And so Christians have to stand up. Slavery was got rid of because one man stood in Parliament and made a stand against slavery. And he was persecuted. But he did it and he kept on doing it. And guess what happened? In the end, he won. But he had to go through a time where he was vilified. Winston Churchill stood against Nazism in his wilderness years. Everyone said he was wrong. He warned the country time after time, you've got to rearm. Germany's rearming. The Nazis are out. You know, in 1934, a friend of mine who's gone to be with the Lord, in 1934 in Austria, he was already in a concentration camp for his Christian faith. Over two million Christians died in concentration camps because they wouldn't be part of the Nazi system. And... Winston Churchill stood up and they vilified him. In the end, they asked him to come and run, you know, be prime minister. In the end, they realized he was right. The blithering idiot Chamberlain and the communists in the Labour Party, they ignored it until it was too late. And thank God there was a Winston Churchill to stand up. God raised up a man. One man, really. And we've got to wake up. 
the church of Jesus Christ has got to be a voice. We're not here to be neutered. We're not here to be like a neutered cat. We're here to stand for what's right. And this is what he's talking about in Ecclesiastes. You know, um, if you want to know, it really makes me angry when I see what's happening in society. Every day I see stupid things. And it makes me mad. Why should we bow to evil? Why should we let, you know, the daughters of music bought low? People are afraid. They're afraid to say anything. Oh, you can't do that. Well, you can. If enough of us do it, then things will change. The trouble is with society, let someone else do it. Oh, well, you know, it's not my responsibility. Uh, well, the Church of Jesus Christ has got to wake up. Also, verse 5, um, when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fear shall be in the way. People are afraid in the street now. You know, I go down to places where um, I can't believe this could happen in our country, but I used to remember when they talked of America, in America, you don't go down Harlem. When I was over years ago, 30 years ago, I went to Chicago, and they said in the hotel, don't go down the main street in Chicago. Why? Because nine people have been shot dead in the last day. Um, and they said, don't go out, it's dangerous. In the main high street in Chicago. And I thought this could never happen in Britain. Now Britain's more dangerous than New York. You walk down the road sometimes and it's more dangerous in certain parts of Brixton, in certain parts of um, Lewisham, it's more dangerous. There's more knife crime. They don't report it anymore in the papers. They don't want people to know how bad it is. What's gone wrong? What's gone wrong with our society in Birmingham? What's gone wrong with our society? I'll tell you what's gone wrong. They've stopped calling it crime anymore. They've, you know, they've recategorized everything and they tell us they're beating crime. They're not beating crime. It's higher than it's ever been. They've just taken a load of things that are crime out of the, the statistics and call them something else. We need to wake up. Hey, I think that everyone should be able to walk down the street. I can go to places like Argentina and in Cordoba, anyone can walk down the street at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the morning and you're perfectly safe. You wouldn't be safe in Brixton. You wouldn't be safe in London. You wouldn't be safe in any place. And you couldn't even be safe in Brentwood on a Friday or Saturday night. Something's gone wrong. And our society just backs off. And the Christians, I mean, they send people out as street pastors. They're not street pastors. They're blinking disasters. Um... The thing is, the real issue is, hey, where is reality? Where is it? In my day, when I was in the police, if they carried a knife, they went inside. Nowadays, everyone does. The kids stab each other, you know, and, and the police won't go into certain areas. It's too dangerous. What's going on? Uh, they love it so. We need to wake up. Someone needs to be a voice. Uh, fear shall be in the way. The almond tree blossoms. The grasshopper shall be a burden. And desire shall fail. How can a grasshopper be a burden? Because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. In other words, everything's become a depression area. People just give in. Nothing you can do. I remember when it was nice. Now it's, well, you know, used to be. Well, Christians can stand up and say, hey, we're going to make a difference. Amen? Oh. Amen? Amen? 
You know, if everyone stands up, instead of, you know, and you get your manhood back, some of you looked as though you'd jumped over a barbed wire fence when you were young and lost it. You've got to get up and you've got to be strong. You know, a man's got to be a man. A man's got to do what a man's got to do. That's what it says in Proverbs. Oh, no, it was John Wayne. But that was. Or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the system. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. You know, from dust we came to dust we go. But for goodness sake, we can change things. Either we let that happen and death come, or we stand up and we fight for life. Either we say, I'm not putting up with that, or we just say, oh well, nothing you can do. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. All is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. What did the preacher do? He said, look, the only way to get people to wake up is to bring the word of God back. You see, the touchstone of tr truth and the light for our path is the word of God. And so the preacher was smart. He sought out the proverbs, he sought out the things, and he started telling people, look, this is the way it should be. Goes on. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. You know, one of the things that happened to me was recently was when I, I started looking in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and I saw that everything God made and the whole of creation and then it says what God did can't be changed. It, it can't be. You know, it was, it is and it shall be. God's plan and God's pattern is God's plan and God's pattern. Man can't change it. You can't change the weather. You cannot change the climate. Whatever these blithering idiots say, you cannot change the wind. You can't cause a baby to grow in the womb. You can't cause seed to come forth. You can't control things. God does. Once you plant a seed, you don't know how it grows. God is the one who gives increase. You cannot do anything. And it's time you looked at it and said, that's it. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the master of assemblies which are given from one shepherd. Now preachers and teachers they should get the words there's only one shepherd, one true shepherd. He's the king of kings and lord of lords and the words that come forth are like goads. They're, they're things like cattle prods. You've got to prod people might not be pleasant, but you've got to wake people up. And it's they like nails. You know, have you ever seen a broken down ramshackle place? The first thing you want to do is fix it. And when you've got to fix it, you've got to pick it up and you've got to nail the things back in place and you've got to get it going. Okay. Um, and further, by these, my son, be admonished. Of making many books there is no end, and much studying is a weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. I love this. God always puts a conclusion at everything. And here's the conclusion. And you need to hear this. Um, here's the conclusion. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man.
What's your duty? Fear God, keep his commandments. That is your whole duty. It's not to conform to society. It's not to conform to, you know, the modern day trends. It's not to conform to anything. It's to do what God says. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And when you fear God, you know that everything's coming to judgment. It's no good, and the word of God's going to judge it. It's no good pretending that it's okay. It's not okay. Now either you get your heart right and you deal with it in this life, or you're going to sure deal with it in the next life. And anything that's kept secret is going to be shouted from the housetops. And there's no way out of it. I was reading on my Facebook, there's a man who wrote, you know, well, we don't need to mention hell anymore. And he was saying, you know, well, uh, gospel preachers, they try and make people afraid. But there is a hell, you know. You can't get away from the fact hell exists and there's people who are going to hell. And every work and everything's going to come to judgment, both the good and the bad. And it's no good pretending it doesn't matter because it does. God says so. Now, a Christian gets his life right and thank God the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. And repentance is part of a gift of God to those who come to life. But one thing you've got to face is people are saying, oh, well, you know, there's no judgment. It's okay. You can live this way. It doesn't matter what you do. You're a Christian. No, 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 no. no you're still going to come to judgment. You'll lose your reward. When you get to glory, you'll find your rewards go. Everything will be burnt up by far your soul will be saved as by far but you'll suffer loss that's what the bible teaches in corinthians and, and those are true words and so what i'm saying is all of us have a responsibility we have a responsibility to do what god wants to fear god and to keep his commandments that is the first and most important thing and if you ignore it, you ignore it at your peril. If you say, well, I don't believe in it, it will done all to the fact that's the truth. You can say, well, you know, my opinion. Who cares about your opinion? It's God's opinion that counts. Well, the Lord showed me. Did he really? I don't think so. The book says it. And the book is superior to your opinion or your revelation. Is that plain? Uh, and we have to be the people of God who stand up for righteousness. And if we don't do it, no one else is going to. And we, one day we can turn around and say, well, uh, you know, we didn't know this was going to happen. I tell you, it, it's going to happen because you stood and did nothing. God will hold you to account. Because your whole duty, the whole of the duty of man, is to fear God and to keep his commandments. And one of the commandments is you, you, you've got to preach. You've got to sow in season and out of season. You've got to be faithful with the word of God. You can't afford to mess with sin. You can't afford to be rebellious. You know, one of the things that children are today is rebellious. Um, I, I had three kids, I'll tell you this. My view was in the home, when they were told to do something, they were told once. If they didn't do it the first time, it was defiance. And they very quickly realized defiance was painful. They got a smack. And I'll tell you something they realized they did what they were told, period. Now, if you love your children, that's the way you bring them up. If you hate them, 
you compromise. You don't distract a child in order to get them to do right. You tell them, that's it. And when they said to me, why? As they got older, they learnt the word, why? Do this, why? The answer was always simple. Because. That was it. No explanation, no reasoning, no counsel. Because. You see, if a parent tells a child, the Bible says, children, obey your parents. Doesn't give any condition. That's what you're to do. And if a parent says, do it, you do it. And if you don't do it, you should get a little tap on your rump to know that if you defy them, you are going to suffer. And one of the things I did, I, I never let our kids spoil our lives. If they were going to cry, they went up to their bedroom. When they changed their face and came down and apologized, they could come out of their room. Until then, that was it. They learned pretty quick that it was being isolated in their bedroom wasn't a good thing. And they could shout and cry, but it didn't affect me. We were downstairs. We didn't care. Shout as much as you like. You're not going to affect me. You know, I don't let a child moan. Moaning's wrong. You know, one of the, my son, one time he was about five or six, and I took him somewhere, and when he was in front of people, he thought he'd have a go, so he tried moaning. I picked him up by one arm. I took him round the corner. I whopped him one. He never tried it again. He realized he couldn't get away with it in the home or outside the home. That's it. You know? It's not a question of eat food or don't eat food. You do as you're told. And that's it. You don't have negotiation. There is no negotiation. And when you bring up a child like that, it says in my Bible, train the child in the way they should go. When they're old, they won't depart. It's amazing if you train them. I've had dogs. You know, dogs are the same as children. In fact, sometimes much more civilized. Because a child seems to be born with the inability to sin. Whereas a dog, you know, pretty quickly wants to learn to please its master. You learn. But there has to be clear guidance. Now, what happens is when you grow up, if the habit of disobedience is built into someone, they will never obey God. Because they learnt to do their own will and their own way. And so if God doesn't birth them from above and transform their lives, you've got a major problem on your hands. And it's a major problem. And that's why society has collapsed. Because no one's cared enough for the children to put discipline in. And once you put discipline in, one of the things when I started the church 34 years ago, I used to have meetings for all the families, you know, families with young children. And I would tell them, teach them how to bring up their kids. My wife and I would sit them down and say, well, this is the way to do it. And I'll tell you something. They all ended up doing well at school. It was our school. They all ended up in university. They got good degrees. They got good education. They got a good life grounding. Why? Because there was someone there that learned, taught the parents to say no. And that meant the carpet fitter, the plumber, and all the people, their children went to university way beyond their expectation because children are brainy enough to learn if they're disciplined. And you teach them the parameters of life. I believe in living, and I won't let children make their decisions. Since when has a child got the maturity to think? When they're teenagers, they still don't think. There was a car sticker I saw in America once, and it was quite a good one for the Americans. Employ a teenager while he knows everything. 
Uh, and, you know, kids think they know everything. They know nothing. They have no experience. They don't know their face from their backside. You have to realize they've got to learn. And we Christians are there to set an example and show them this is the way it is. The world's getting worse and worse. We've got to teach them. We have a responsibility before God. And that's the way it is. Ecclesiastes, you can read it yourself. I'm not making it up. It's in the book. If you want to argue with God, send him a letter. Tell him to change his mind. I want to tell you, he won't. God's God. People say, oh, well, 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 I don't agree. Well, I don't care whether you agree or not. That's what God says. End of story. We need to be people of the book, not people of opinions. Who gives a toss about your opinion? And, you know, it talks in Ezekiel, Ecclesiastes, very interesting. It talks about people that have dreams and have visions, nutcases. Tells you exactly what he thinks of them. You'll find that in chapter 7, I think it is, of Ecclesiastes. I, I love it. It's so plain. You know, Solomon might have made a few mistakes, but he sure learned his lesson. He expresses it so well. It's a good book to learn. God wants us to be people of the book. And we'll be out of step with society, but I don't want to be in step with those, do you? I mean, every politician's a crook, they, or they're in it for money. They care not a jot for society, really. We've got to face it. Jesus Christ is the one who cares. He's the one who's come to lift us up. Amen? Amen. And it can be different. We can change everything. It just takes, Wesley said it would take ten men to change the nation found it hard to find two got to make a stand amen let's pray father I just thank you for your word Lord for the truth of your word stir up every heart to believe in the power of your word Lord and the reality of your word we're here and our whole duty is to obey your commands and to fear you and honor you. Lord, write that in the heart of each one, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen?